welcome everyone. We're going to give everybody just a Another 30 seconds or so to jump on the call and then we'll get started. Okay, good morning and happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome to the local government coordination call. This is our 93rd call. This monthly call is provided to support local governments in navigating state and federal funding opportunities. Today's funding topic is highlighting best practices for applying for funding. Um, I'm Dave Bowman, currently the Deputy Director of the Division of Local Government, and I'll be hosting the call this morning. This call will also provide an opportunity to receive important and timely updates from DOLA and other state agencies, and we'll begin with some general DOLA updates. From the State Demography Office, the State Demography Office is currently producing the 2023 population and housing unit estimates for counties and municipalities. Your contact there is Nancy Gideon at nancy.gideon at state.co.us if you have any questions, and that contact will be placed in the chat. The SDO is also starting their annual production of population and household forecast for counties. If you'd like to provide input on this year's forecast, please contact Cindy DeGrone at cindy.degrone at state.co.us. That email address will also be placed in the, um, the chat. From the Division of Housing, we have a few DOLA updates. The Division of Housing um, is holding three application rounds towards statewide balance cap private activity bonds. An application for $13.1 million was received in the first round. And the State Housing Board awarded the full amount on April 9th. This reduced the available cap to $41,545. There will not be a second round June 1st application for activity funding due to insufficient cap. The next available application submission will be the third round, which will be due on November 1st. It will be open to any issuing authorities and to pipeline requests. The Multifamily Affordable Housing Electrification Hub. We are excited to share an interactive online resource developed to help equip the multifamily affordable housing community in Colorado with technical and practical knowledge related to electrification design. The site includes case studies, technical explainers, and a searchable library of financing and development resources. When the site was launched in December, 2023, a webinar was held to demonstrate its various features. The recording of the webinar is available online. Questions about the hub and suggestions for future content additions may be submitted to multifamily-ehub at cafainfo.com. The Colorado Multifamily Electrification Hub is proudly offered by Colorado Housing and Finance Authority in partnership with the Colorado Energy Office, the Department of Local Affairs, Division of Housing, Energy Outreach Colorado, Group 14 Engineering, and the Office of Economic Development and International Trade and International Enterprise Community Partners. From the Division of Local Government side, for those who opted into Prop 123, the local planning capacity grants can fund adoption of expedited review, hiring staff and consultants, making land use changes, software solutions, and more. The current funding round opened May 1st and will close June 3rd. Applicants must meet with Robin DeFalco program managers to discuss their project and be invited to apply. You can find more information on the DLG website. Also, we have published guidance on how to interpret the statutory requirement for expedited review of affordable housing projects. The Community Development Office is hosting a monthly peer exchange series for local governments working on affordable housing strategies and land use issues. This interactive virtual series will take place on the third Thursday of each month, starting tomorrow, May 16th, 
from 9 to 10 a.m. The intent of the series is to provide a forum for sharing challenges, successes, and innovative approaches for peer communities who are implementing solutions to local housing challenges. Ample time will be provided for questions and discussions. The first topic on May 16th will address software solutions for expedited review. Housing authorities in June, future topics will be selected based on participant input. Register for the series to add the Zoom event to your calendar and receive updates about future scheduled topics. Applications are open for the Microgrids for Community Resilience Program through June 13th. Recordings from all three MCR technical assistance webinars on the Microgrid are on the Microgrids program webpage. You may also join the May 30th, 1 to 2 p.m. office hours for a last minute for any last minute questions ahead of the application deadline. And we'll now hear from our own Snow Staples from DOLA and Alyssa Denberg from the governor's office for some brief updates. Hey y'all, I think Snow needs to be moved into as a panelist. I just moved her up. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. All right, Snow, are you okay. able to? There we go. Perfect. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Sorry about that. Uh, my mm -hmm. name is Snow Staples. I am the LOMA program manager. Uh, many of you have probably heard of LOMA at this point, but for those of you that haven't, LOMA stands for Local Match, uh, and it is grant money that's to be used to support local governments and their non-federal match requirement on federal IIJA applications. Those eligible to apply for LOMA are Colorado counties, municipalities, special districts, and federally recognized tribes. Um, to date, LOMA is proud to announce that they have supported 23 local governments um, in their efforts to pursue federal applications, and five of those local governments have already received notice of winning the federal award with many applications still pending. Today, there is still funding available in the LOMA pool, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me about that. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Alyssa Denberg. Thanks, Snow. Hi, everyone. Um, similarly to the LOMA program, we have the grant writing program. So I just wanted to remind you all that that is available. There's four different options within the grant writing program. Um, there is an independent review, which is um, if you have somebody that's able to write the grant, we can do an independent review of the grant. Uh, you can also work with our consultants as a co-write, and so this is kind of like a partnership with the consultants to get the grant written. And then the third grant writing option is a full write. So if you really just don't have the capacity to write a grant, um, we could potentially provide a full write for you. The fourth piece of the program is project planning. Um, so say you need engineering support or you need some type of planning to be able to submit that grant, we're able to provide consultants to support that effort as well. So we do still have funding available for grant writing. Um, this program can only be used on IIJA and or IRA programs that are submitted to the federal government. So if it is a program that is funded by IIJA, but is flowing through the state. Unfortunately, this program is not eligible to support those efforts. Um, please reach out to either myself or Snow if you have questions. We're happy to answer any types of questions you have, whether the grant is eligible or if um, your community is a good applicant for it, please reach out. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to share is a map. This is a public map um, that is being updated weekly. It shows where communities have been invested in with both I with both the grant writing program as well as LOMA. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, it is through Google Maps, so it's pretty easy to use. Um, the way that we have it broken out here, um, right now, you, it's separated by the councils of government. So each one of these is a council of government. However, you can turn that off 
and do it for DOLA regional manager regions, or you can turn it off altogether. Um, and then the little pins are where investments have been made. So the blue pins are local match assistant program, and then the red pins are grant writing and technical assistance awards. And if you click on it, it'll tell you what program they received support on. Um, so I will put a link up to this in the chat. Feel free to reference it. If you have any questions, feel free. Um, and I hope that it's helpful for you. Thank you all. And Alyssa, were you going to continue on the ARPA reporting? Yes, my apologies. I forgot that I had that as well. Um, as most of you know, we did have an ARPA report due to the Federal Treasury last month. Um, I just wanted to put a call out there. If you have not gotten your report in yet and you're having issues, please reach out. Um, the Office of the State Controller is available to walk you through any issues that you're having. Um, they can actually get into the portal and show you different tips and tricks that they've learned. Um, in previous times, we've offered a, a webinar slash workshop, um, but we felt like doing one one-on-one -on -one support was more impactful. Um, so if you have any issues or questions or anything like that, please reach out and we can definitely get you connected and help you get that report submitted. All right, thank you, Alyssa. And next we'll hear from Ari Moladina from the Colorado Energy Office. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name's Ari Moladina and I am the Renewable Energy Program Manager with the Colorado Energy Office. And I just wanted to provide a brief update on the APPS program. Um, the, the grant program is now open for applications and grants are being awarded on a first come first serve basis until June 4th. Uh, so this program is also called Automated Permit Processing for Solar. Uh, and the eligible applicants are local and tribal governments who are working to adopt an automated permitting platform. Uh, so ones that you might have heard of include Solar App or Symbium. Uh, and these platforms really help streamline the solar permitting process for jurisdictions because they're able to instantly verify code compliance of permit applications and therefore can typically issue permits in around 30 minutes or less. Uh, so this really helps with saving staff processing time. Um, it helps to make permit applications, application processes more seamless for contractors as well as installers. Um, and then ultimately just helps local residents in your community go solar more quickly. Uh, so this grant covers any costs associated with platform adoption. So that includes staff time, hiring of external consultants, if you organize any trainings, um, and then if there's any sort of installation or integration fees with your current permitting platform, that's also included. Um, and so, yeah, as I mentioned, grants are open now. They'll be open until uh, June 4th. And the application process is super straightforward. It's a simple checkbox based application and then an accompany accompanying budget form. Um, and so I will add the uh, links in the chat right now to the application materials, as well as my email. Um, feel free to reach out directly to me if you have any questions. And that is about it. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Ari. And next, I will turn it over to our own Shale Sabo to dive into our Pathways webinar. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Um, so this is a continual series that we offer on the local government call each month that helps local communities navigate federal and state funding opportunities. Um, today, instead of covering specific funding opportunities, we're gonna talk a bit about grant application best practices because we do recognize that there are several communities that may be applying for things like federal funds for the first time. So we have some great speakers lined up for you. We're going to kick it off with Hannah Reed from CDOT who um, is gonna speak from the CDOT perspective, but a lot of the uh, highlighted opportunities she's gonna talk about do apply for other types of grant programs. And because there's such an infrastructure focus on the federal funding, we are working with her. She will then be followed by Patrick Rondinelli who is the Southwest Regional Manager at DOLA and can speak from the regional manager perspective. And then we will end today's um, program with Jillian Laycock, who's the town manager for the town of Akron. Um, in our survey responses, we heard requests from 
you all to, to highlight more um, things that are going on from the local government perspective and to hear from some of your peers um, on some of the successes that they're having. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Hannah. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? You sound great, Hannah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Hannah Reed. I am CDOT's Grants Manager. I want to thank you all for letting me share with you CDOT's experience with pursuing and winning federal grants today. Uh, we can go ahead and start with the next slide. So uh, federal grant programs at a glance are typically comprised of the same major components. The Notice of Funding Opportunity or the NOFO will announce the beginning and deadline of, of a program or an application window. And everything you need to know about how to present your project in the light that the federal awarding agency is looking for is pretty explicitly detailed in the NOFO. So you wanna take your time to review it as soon as it comes out. Um, CDOT uses kind of a triangle strategy where we look at the hard and fast eligibility criteria at the narrowest pinpoint of the program. So we look at um, whether our project meets statutory requirements or is it informed by the results of preliminary engineering can we meet obligation and expenditure deadlines? Do we meet federal and non-federal cost share requirements? Do we have a budget um, and things like that? And then we move into the broader parts of the triangle that investigate the specific eligibility and other kind of niche details of the program that we're interested in. So these are just some examples of the program quirks that we run into in the past. Um, when Protect came out, it was widely advertised but never really explained all that well. Um, that the PROTECT program will only fund the individuated components of your project that specifically address resilience. So you can't just request for a bridge replacement to take it out of a flood zone. You have to pull out the resilience components specifically. And it was very, uh, very complicated. Um, and then in this, like for the bridge investment program in the spirit of equity, the federal government is required by statute to award um, one large bridge award or two small bridge awards to every single state before the end of IIJA. So for example, if Mesa County got a large bridge award, um, all of Colorado would actually be bumped to the bottom of the national list for that program. So very interesting things to pay attention to when you're reviewing NOFOs for a program. Um, the average application package does include your narrative, your standard forms, or your SF-424s. Um, and then more often than not for capital requests, you'll get a benefit cost analysis. Uh, so you wanna give yourself as much preparedness as possible so that you can focus on developing the best version of your application. And those efforts don't go to waste because of an administrative hurdle or a finish line fumble that you weren't anticipating. So something as trivial, as seemingly trivial as where you attach your final narrative PDF um, can actually disqualify your application before it even gets to reviewers. So just be very, very careful. Um, I've personally been sprinting just a few hours ahead of a deadline before, only to hit a brick wall because I opened up the SF-424 and it's asking me for the nine digit zip code of CDOT and I have only ever had the five digit zip code. And so I had to do a little research that I hadn't budgeted for um, in these very, very precious minutes on submission day. So. Um, just be careful and, and try to be as um, preliminary and early as possible with, with getting your application and your administrative tasks out of the way. Um, next slide, please. So there is only so much that you can reasonably do to prepare for all contingencies, but don't let yourself get surprised so much so that it costs you all the time and effort you put into building your application. So log into grants.gov. That's the most common application portal for federal uh, discretionary grant programs. Um, as soon as the NOFO comes out, get into grants.gov, make sure that you can apply, make sure you have permission from your agency's grants.gov profile owner to submit and edit applications. Make sure your SAM.gov registration is active. Um, this needs to be renewed every two years for each individual and in, um, agency. So that can, uh, that can interrupt things when you don't want it to um, at the very kind of 11th hour. So just be paying attention. Um, and these are all situations that I've personally encountered as recently as just a few months ago. So even though I've been doing this for a couple of years, I still get stuck on these administrative hurdles. So just be just be aware and, and make sure that you are able to devote as much time as possible to building a beautiful application and you're not stuck on these, on these areas here. Uh, next slide. 
So now that you've confirmed a baseline eligibility and you've kind of checked your administrative technicalities, you are ready to develop your project story and make yourself really competitive. Um, at CDOT, we work off of a blanket assumption that competitors will check every box of the NOFO. So we use that to motivate ourselves to present the best version of our project with accuracy as well as aligning with what's in um, what's in the, the NOFO itself. So uh, an example I like to provide is that a recent application we've worked on, we revised it and submitted it three times. Um, and we heard every single debrief that we've had in the past we just really couldn't get over the environmental merit criteria because just based on the nature of the project itself. So this last time we reached out to a recycled plastics asphalt firm and talked to them about potentially using this more environmentally conscious material in constructing our project. And so worst case scenario, the federal reviewers give us the same score they've been giving us in environmental or best case scenario, they see it and say, that's really interesting. Not many other applicants are considering recycled asphalt, and we get points that we didn't have before. Um, so for areas where you can't, you just feel like you can't check the box that the federal awarding agency is looking for, we try to emphasize where we know our project competitively excels already, and then try to negotiate an adjacent competitive competitiveness in areas where we might be lacking. So one of the big things that jumps out in this area quite often is um, areas of persistent poverty or historically disadvantaged community designation. So USDOT provides several tools of their own design that determines whether a community is disadvantaged based on either of those metrics. Um, these tools also show individual sectors like, social, like disadvantaged social vulnerability, transportation security, health and environment, and things like that. So even if your community doesn't register as disadvantaged based on USDOT's designation, you can use their own tools to investigate whether your community is disadvantaged in an isolated sector. Um, so maybe your county is like the 98th percentile for high transportation costs. Maybe your municipality is above the 70th percentile in three different environmental metrics and things like that and build that into your narrative. So you can at least kind of brush up against that competitive um, criteria. And then of course, consider your project's priorities and benefits and how your project aligns with federal interests. So consider the schedule and order of your project's components or other related investments around your project. Um, CDOT had a highway grade separation project with Jefferson County that we tried to go after a grant for a little too soon and found out kind of during that early process that there was historic significance surrounding the project area and it completely derailed our original schedule and right-of-way cost estimates. So it's really important to kind of consider um, and be prepared and go in with your design and all of your um, environmental boxes checked early so you don't get surprised. Um, and then consider how your project might be a smaller component of a larger safety issue that needs addressing. So you can talk about a greater geographic impact in your narrative as long as you don't claim those benefits in your BCA. So if you're building your benefit cost analysis with a certain, you can only have five to seven years of crash data that inform your BCA, but in your narrative, you can describe decades of like escalating crashes and safety concerns in your project area. Uh, next slide, please. And then think about competitive merit beyond your immediate project. So CDOT analyzed three years of raise awards and discovered that towns, cities, and counties were awarded at significantly higher rates than any other type of applicant, including state DOTs, um, transit authorities, uh, parks and wildlife, things like that. Um, so CDOT started partnering with locals to co-sponsor and like kind of jointly ap apply priority projects for both entities and get more awards into the state of Colorado. Um, if the program that you're interested in has never awarded more than like $20 million for a large project and you're asking for 60 million, you'll likely take a competitive hit there. So it's important to look at the history of the program itself. Um, and then this is just another list of competitive areas that could help you out. Um, if your project can move dirt tomorrow versus a project that hasn't even started NEPA, you'll be more competitive. If your project area has higher daily traffic counts, you can reasonably claim that you're serving more travelers and be more competitive in that way. 
Um, and if your project area sees like five accidents a year, but they're all fatal or serious injury, you're more competitive than another project that might see 10 or 15 accidents a year, but they're all property damage crashes. So you'll have a more competitive story and a higher benefit cost analysis. Next slide, please. Um, CDOT approaches federal grant opportunities from our pre-established priorities. So CDOT's 10-year plan is a comprehensive stakeholder-informed pipeline of priority projects divided by CDOT's engineering regions. Uh, significant work was put into building this document and just by being on the 10-year plan, our project checks a lot of boxes for the average grant program. We have stakeholder and community engagement. We have cost share match funding requirements. Um, we have high-level one-pagers that address benefits of the and co existing conditions of the project area. And so while we try to keep our finger on the pulse by updating the 10-year plan regularly, we understand that things change as quickly as day-to-day. -day. So emergency repairs or environmental disasters can bump projects up in priority. Uh, we also rely on our regional staff to offer boots on the ground perspective of what's going on in their communities. Uh, CDOT is always open hearing from our local partners partners on potential applications, of course. Um, next slide, please, actually. I have to say that, thank you. Um, and CDOT support is determined independently, case by case, and the depth of support varies based on priorities in that 10-year plan, the bandwidth of our internal staff, and the competitiveness and readiness of the project. So CDOT tries to provide as many letters of support as is appropriate for SS4A application since state uh, governments are otherwise ineligible of participating in that program, but we want to see safer roads in our state. Um, and then, of course, when our own infrastructure is involved in the project, we look for ways to collaborate and support as well. So CDOT's, um, these are just a few examples of ways that we've helped in the past and collaborated in the past. Um, CDOT's Region 2 leadership provided a small financial match to Trinidad for a Reconnecting Communities grant because the I-25 viaduct divides the city. Um, my grants team supported Idaho Springs with their planning grant for RAISE 2023, which was awarded, which is great, um, because I-70 also divides Idaho Springs. And then um, when Glenwood Canyon is closed on I-70, excuse me, and local roads are kind of overrun by unendorsed interstate traffic detours, CDOT has been supporting some of those local counties with their um, own local road improvements as a result. Next slide, please. So the next several slides are just helpful links. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little sick right now. I apologize. Um, and contact information for some more specific help as you guys move through um, the IIJA and grant programs. So I do want to point at Ajin Hu. On this list of FHWA, she used to work at CDOT in our Region 2 team in Southeast Colorado. She's incredibly knowledgeable and helpful. Um, and then next slide, please. Here are a bunch of CDOT contacts for you to tap into. Anyone on this list will be able to at least route you to where you can get help if CDOT is able to provide it. And of course, I've included a next slide, sorry. And of course, I've included my contact information as well as my fellow grant writer, Anna Dunn, here at CDOT. And so that is all I've got for you today. I appreciate your attention and your interest in grants. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, we'll now move on to Patrick. Thanks, Shale. And um, thanks, Hannah. That was great information to have there. So I'm just going to talk really high level about some of the challenges that I see in the communities I've talked to um, and what they're facing when they're trying to seek out some of the federal funding, um, some base solutions that are out there that would help you uh, in regards to those, uh, getting those dollars that you might need for those projects you have, and then obviously talk some of the resources that are out there. So next slide, please. So very first com common challenge that I hear about from a lot of the communities I work with is just trying to identify what potential programs are out there. Uh, so, you know, you in a community, you've got a, a problem, an issue that you're trying to address, a project that needs to be done, um, being able to say, okay, where can we start to go with? Now, obviously, a lot of people start with us at the state, reaching out to us, but with the opportunities of the federal funding that is out there, um, 
there becomes that big challenge of where to start looking and how do you find the right fit? Um, and I'll get into some of those resources here a little bit down the line. Um, the other challenge I hear about too is it's not just going off a title of a program that's out there or the NOFO, but re really reading into and understanding um, what is the program, what are successful grants for the program or what are eligible projects for the program, um, and really trying to find the right fit for your project and your need that's out there. And I think Hannah did a great job of talking about some of the ways that you can look at those programs to try and identify those and, and find ways that you can um, find the right program that's going to fit for you and exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Um, another one that you want to pay attention to are those requirements that for the program. Um, as once again, as Hannah said up front, you want to make sure you've got all the pieces that you need in place to help you, um, or, or excuse me, all the requirements that will be necessary to help with your application, but also what you're going to be expected to do on the administration side um, and, and making sure you understand that. A lot of times when I'm working with communities, they compare it to our grant programs. And while we do have all those requirements, obviously on our end, what you have to do to have a successful application, the kind of questions we ask in our application and what's involved in the administration side, it is much more complex uh, on these federal programs. So you really wanna pay attention, understand what's out there. Um, and then as mentioned before too, is the complexity of these applications can be difficult. They do take a lot of time uh, to put together and, not only understanding what is going to be required to make your project competitive and have the best opportunity for you to receive that funding, but to build that story, to build that narrative around your application. Um, and then, like I said before, uh, really playing for your what's going to take with the administration. So what's the biggest challenge that everybody faces? Capacity, um, especially with our rural, more rural communities, having the capacity um, to do that research, to take that time, uh, to understand what it's going to take to not only submit that application, but what it's going to take to administer everything in relationship to the grant funding on top of, oh yeah, you're trying to manage a project and oversee what's happening there too. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the solutions that are out there, um, obviously very similar. Once again, when you're talking about some of the state programs, we always encourage you to talk to us, talk to us first, talk to us about what your project is, what you're trying to do. Is it a good fit for a particular program that's out there um, where you can with the federal programs, seek out those contacts. Also, not all programs have somebody that you can speak to, uh, but there are some programs out there or, or some agencies that do have uh, a resource that is um, available to you that you want to be able to talk to, get your project in front of them, um, get some input on what you're trying to do. Um, you know, once again, trying to help out with some of that research up front and the planning that you'll need to do will help with your application as you move forward to do the submission. The grant navigators, um, I'm gonna talk more about the grant navigators here in just a minute, but uh, all the councils of governments across the state have grant navigators um, that you can contact. And um, while their work can vary by region, um, I can say a lot of the navigators that I've been working with are really great at, once again, helping a community and do some of that research and administrative um, oversight on the front end to help prepare you for an application. Uh, so just to identify your project and then um, help you with that, uh, the application itself or what you're gonna need for the application and what they've seen. Um, so really a chance to tap into the grant navigators is a great resource. And then collaboration as much as you can, um, you know, whether that's reaching out to your networks, uh, reaching out to other regional uh, entities um, that might be facing similar issues uh, where you can collaborate. I know, once again, in my region, some of the larger communities will often offer some base, basic assistance or guidance to some of the smaller communities that don't have a lot of capacity doesn't mean they're going to do everything for you, but you can really tap into them and get an understanding of what they're experience has been with some of these programs, what they've had to do to get ready and, and learn off of their, their knowledge that's there. Next slide. 
So some of the best practices that are out there, um, first off, have a clear project in your mind and what your need is and what the outcomes. I saw this at the beginning when a lot of this funding was first starting to come out. I'm not seeing as much now, but a lot of people would see a program or come across a program and then they would try to identify a project to fit that program. So they were fishing for the funding in essence. Don't take that approach. I encourage that all the time clearly identify what your need is, what your project is, what um, your challenges that you're trying to overcome, and then start searching for specific funding to meet your project need. That's where you're going to be most successful uh, on with your application and through the process. Be very clear on what the scope of your project is. Um, you want to make sure that you have um, a clearly defined project with parameters. You want to have a clearly defined what your need is, why you're seeking this funding, why you're uh, asking for this assistance and why you can't do it yourself. And then really talk about the measurable outcomes. What are going to be the successes or what are the benefits of once this project is done? And uh, alluding to, once again, what was mentioned before, where you can really focus on is who you're serving with this project um, and where you can identify, especially those underserved or unrepresented uh, members of your community. Uh, but overall, you know, who's going to benefit from this project and what we can do to make sure that, you know, your project is clear with that. Also, you got to really watch. And I've learned this myself, um, administering or managing grants here. Um, Fluff. When you have a lot of fluff on a project or in your application, it's easy to see that. You don't want to do that. Just be clear. Say exactly what it is you're trying to do, why you need assistance on it, and how it's going to benefit the community. Um, it was also mentioned before the importance of having a project that's ready to go. You want to have a realistic timeline that's put together. You want to have any of the other requirements that are out there, whether it's matching funds, um, some of the study, the, the NEPA work that needs to be done ahead of time, making sure those are all complete and accurate um, and ready uh, with that information before you submit your application. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, collaboration is another thing that you wanna look at. Regional projects more and more seem to have the success that I've seen uh, for people, especially in the smaller communities. Um, you know, it's great when you have a small community and an identified need, but once again, you might be lacking in the capacity to be able to manage not only the application process, but the administration of the grant itself. So where you can identify those partnerships and those regional support um, that you're, that you would need to be doing um, and how it can benefit the entire region. Uh, you know, once again, an example that I would give that we saw uh, that we did with, was with the regional recovery roadmaps um, and how attractive that made our application as a state to the EDA to support those programs. But it was because we were tackling a regional collaboration, communities coming together to identify and fix the needs that they have for their areas. And that leads into the other thing, still always talk with relevant state representatives um, or state agencies that might be uh, not only in partnership with you on a project, but that you would be have similar similar benefits to or um, similar alignment with, because there's a lot of times that state agency may be out there seeking funding or maybe the possibility the state would submit an application on behalf of the state and then be able to take that money and distribute it out to the local governments. I know I've been involved in a number of conversations on other projects in the region that have done that. Um, for example, with our partners at the Colorado Energy Office, where they've been the ones that actually submit an application on behalf of the state with the clear goal and in mind of being able to distribute that money out to the local governments once it's awarded to the state. So uh, make sure you're talking with all of us uh, as your contacts there. Next slide. So where I was talking before about some of the technical assistance that you wanna look at, reach out to your network. You know, who are your regional partners? Who are your fellow um, entities, communities that you have a lot of similarities with comparison, maybe other agencies or entities out there that have had a similar project, um, talk with them. Um, I've yet to meet a single entity across the state that's not always happy to share about what their experience was like, what they did to be successful, what were the lessons that they learned through the process with them. Um, 
obviously talk with your membership organizations too. If your county is CCI, uh, they're a great resource to try and direct you to some of the um, other communities that have been successful with some of these programs. Um, municipalities with CML, uh, the districts, obviously talking to the Special uh, Districts Association, SDA, is a great resource to help you with that. Um, and then also use your listservs. A lot of those uh, membership eight organizations have less listserv programs um, that the, you can reach out, once again, a broad outreach across the state. So maybe you don't have anybody in your region or anybody within your immediate network that has applied for some grant funding um, or had a successful application through a federal program, um, use those listservs to reach out and say, hey, is anybody out there familiar with this? Can you give me some direction on it? I'd also like to highlight on the DOLA website, you go to our local community funding guide. Um, there's a link here in the slides. I know that will be made available to you. Um, the funding guide provides a great resource to help you narrow down. As I said before, at the beginning, it gets a little confusing sometimes with all the different programs that are out there. Um, you can really help to using some of the filters on this to narrow it down. Next slide. And then I talked about the the Navigators for the COGS, I want to stress again that while the, well, I haven't said it before, <laughs> um, while the navigators work with the COGS, you do not need to be a COG member um, in order to uh, utilize that resource. Um, those positions were created specifically to be available for anyone and everyone. So um, I know a lot of times I've talked to some communities that are like, well, we're not a member of the COG, we don't pay the dues or whatever, it does not matter. Those resources are there for you, especially the special districts. Uh, you know, oftentimes a lot of the special districts are not necessarily members with the COGS uh, or have a membership with the COG, but please still reach out uh, to those navigators. Um, and if you're not sure, I mean, we've got the list in the community, uh, the names here, but you can always reach out to your regional manager and we're happy to put you in touch with the right person. Next slide. And my contact information, not only just for me, and feel free to reach out to me with any follow-up questions or comments, um, but that link will also will show you who your regional managers are. I think most people are familiar with the eight regional managers across the state, but always don't hesitate to go to our website. Any of us will be happy to help you. If you can't get a hold of the right person, we'll get you in touch with the right person. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And last but certainly not least, we have Jillian. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, inviting me to share uh, some information today. Uh, my name is Gillian Laycock. I am the town manager of Akron. We are in the northeast region out, out on the plains. And um, I have previously served as assistant town manager for the town of Lyman. And I also have served uh, the town of Hugo in the central plains as the main street manager for them for several years. Um, I, uh, my information I'm sharing might sound a little re repetitive. I think that all the presenters today are, are, are sharing uh, very similar information. Um, and, uh, maybe I'll just communicate that in, a, in, in different words. So, um, next slide, please. Uh, so um, I do want to stress, so these are just some, some tips and tricks and insights in regards to, um, successful grant applications. Um, I have uh, written and been awarded uh, many millions of dollars in the last uh, six years uh, for a local level government, which has helped support our communities um, on the Eastern Plains. Um, so really, uh, the, the pre-work, I cannot stress uh, enough about how important the time is uh, spent on developing your project and understanding what that project is. Um, as Patrick shared, um, don't go and look at a grant and then create a project uh, based on that grant. Um, really, you know, focus on what your community needs and, and what that project is to solve that need. So a big component um, is understanding your community and the community demographics that this project will serve. And um, again, understanding the needs of, of, of why you need the project. And again, who that, that project is serving in your community. Um, I cannot stress enough understanding the need for the project and being able to express that. And then also um, the project components and understanding those intimately. Um, understanding all of these things ahead of time really goes into the ease of writing the grant and then a, a project managing the grant uh, once a grant award is received. 
Um, another important uh, part in, in the pre-work for uh, grant applications is really understanding the project timeline and the realistic project costs of what that um, project is going to cost your community. Um, in your timeline, it is important to be able to communicate this in about any grant application. Uh, the, the big one is, can you finish the project in the timeline of the grant that when it needs to be closed out by? Uh, we all um, live on a different timeline now with availability of products, availability of contractors or consultants, things like that. So it's really important to understand that. And that's part of understanding your project as a whole. Um, and then really spending the time researching what the grant is about. And I know uh, Patrick shared, shared this and uh, especially with CDOT grants as well. Um, but I think for any grant, um, whether it's a government grant like we're discussing today or even a philanthropic funded uh, uh, grant uh, project or program is to really spend time and understand and read all the details and attend webinars if there are on that specific grant um, to really understand is this grant going to be a good fit for the project. Uh, and the reason being is you will spend a lot of time developing a grant, people getting involved, people getting excited um, for disappointment. And uh, some, unfortunately, sometimes a waste of time if it's a not good, not a good fit for the grant um, that, that it's trying to fulfill. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so no square pegs and round holes. Uh, this, I like to think about this all the time. Again, you know, is this project the right fit for what the, the grant is uh, for and designed for? Um, you may think that there is, is um, some overlapping components for a project with a grant, but it's not 100%. Um, that, that is a red flag. And um, you would definitely want to pursue and contact the grant manager over that grant. If, if, if you have any hesitation that your project is not a fit, even if you feel like it's a 50% fit. Um, again, uh, you'll spend a lot of time working on a grant application and uh, no one wants to be, you know, we want to get awards rather than spending time and not getting awards. Um, so a big a big uh, benefit is having grant managers. Uh, I think by now almost all the programs uh, do have someone you can contact and speak with. Uh, most uh, grant grants that I um, have come across and applied for, the grant managers will have office hours, and you can um, schedule a time to talk to them. This is a pretty strategic move. I would recommend. Um, if you don't know who the grant manager is over a project, to at least um, meet with them online once uh, to discuss your project ahead of time. And um, this also builds trust and relationship with the grant program managers and the grants that you're applying for. Um, even if you're not awarded that project, um, they're more likely, uh, you know, they'll be very supportive um, in, in understanding what the grant program is. And then um, if you do need to go uh, back for feedback later. Um, it, it is definitely, I would say, across the board with within the state of Colorado, um, it, 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 it will benefit you to spend time uh, talking to any uh, grant manager ahead of submission. And that again is, is across all, all grant sectors. Um, I have put in there that you really can't do this without them. A lot of our grant programs you actually can't apply for without speaking to a grant manager first. And um, again, it will just make a much stronger uh, grant application for you to cover what you're putting in your grant um, with that grant manager before submission. Um, also make sure that you do the community engagement work ahead of time. Um, any more for almost any project, there is an opportunity and a need for community engagement. And what does that look like? Um, discussing that at council meetings, uh, having it on the agenda at a council meeting can often get the word out um, so the community can hear about that. Or um, depending on what the situation is, you can actually hold a community engagement meeting, um, advertise it ahead of time and, and share the projects that are coming. Um, a lot of our projects that we do are all within public right of way. So that communication with the community is really important so you're not all of a sudden replacing a sidewalk or a road 
Um, and then people can't get into businesses or in and out of their homes or to school in the morning. So whether it's utilities or some something fun, um, it, it's really important to do that community engagement uh, ahead of time uh, so that it is also supported in your grant application and you can refer to the stakeholder engagement and the community support in that application, which will show um, again, the intent and the, the pre-planning work that you've done um, in your application. I also, um, uh, next slide, please. So I also wanted to touch on um, some components uh, in, in, to include. So all of that pre-work that grow, goes into your application really uh, helps the, the time spent on writing an application because all that work and, and energy and effort's been um, done ahead of time. Uh, give yourself uh, plenty of time uh, to, to fill out the grant application. You also heard in the, in the uh, CDOT presentation, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of time doing all this administrative work in the fifth hour when you're trying to hit submit before midnight, which I think we've all done. Um, anticipate that uh, the budget was going to take twice, twice as long as what you plan. Um, this is just in my experience, writing the actual content of the grant when you're passionate about your community that you're serving, uh, the words um, might flow a lot quicker than really building that budget. A lot of the time you have to wait on multiple quotes. Um, so that that time really does take a long time uh, to get your budget uh, clear and defined and with everything in it that you need. And then also, it uh, doesn't matter what the project is, always plan on some contingency funding. So don't forget to include that. Um, we all deal with the administrative burden of grants, um, but also plan um, on, on putting contingency funding in there uh, just because we, we, we are not in the 1950s and our, our markets are volatile with change. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, um, I'm I'm trying to uh, speed up my presentation here, so I'm wondering how how much of this I should cover. Um, I think one of the big things is really to um, celebrate the fact that you submit a grant. Uh, uh, not uh, all grants are awarded, and typically. The only time it's celebrated is when you are awarded a grant. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes in ahead of time. So give yourself or give uh, each other a high five if you're working as a team when you do get a grant submitted. And always have your content on a Word document to copy and paste it into the portal because they will time out. Um, next slide, please. Um, so expect follow-up questions and um, know that the more pre-work you do to be prepared, uh, the easier those those follow-up questions uh, will be when, when you do get questions about your application. And um, if you are not uh, awarded an app, a, a grant award, always um, go back and ask that grant manager for feedback on your grant and why you didn't get that and go back and apply again. Don't, don't give up if you don't get a, an award the first time. Next slide, please. Um, I think another big thing in municipal government is to really uh, partner with your town clerk or your finance staff so they know once you've, once you've got an award, what the project scope is going to be and how that invoicing needs to be processed and recorded uh, for easier administration. Um, and then if your project is going off the rails, uh, definitely reach out to your grant manager right away. Again, it doesn't matter what sector or industry this is in. Um, don't suffer in silence and, and, and um, die under the stress of your project going off the rails financially or on timeline. Um, reach out to whoever, whoever that, that grant manager is right away and start discussing a plan on, um, on, on how to get your project finished um, and, and what that looks like. So there's no half-built uh, buildings that, that are waiting on funding for another 10 years. Next slide, please. So um, we can uh, hop through these slides pretty quick. This is an example. Um, Akron recently re uh, received a grant award for a downtown revitalization project. Um, we have 12 uh, 
downtown street pole lights, which are, I, th I think were installed probably in the 1940s or 50s and um, overhead wires um, that are actually very dangerous, both in the wind and with our high truck traffic. So we will be replacing those street light poles with 34 new poles um, and doing directional boring under our sidewalks uh, to remove the overhead wires. So we're really excited about what this is going to do for downtown revitalization. Um, this project also includes um, uh, accessibility for sidewalk ramps and then um, installing a small civic plaza to really be an anchor point uh, in our downtown revitalization work. Next slide, please. So this is just some pictures of what our downtown looks like today. Um, we have a picture there um, where we actually had a, a, a semi-truck come through and rip down the wires, which pulled down our only town's traffic lights. So uh, this is definitely a safety need as well as a revitalization um, project. Next slide, please. And this is the location where we will be transforming a, a dirt lot uh, into a community park. Um, next slide, please. This is in the heart of our downtown. So you can see here some pictures of the community engagement work that we've done. Um, we are just under 2,000 people in Akron. So when we have 35 or 45 people show up at a community engagement meeting, we get very excited and um, just have some you know, local effort um, engagement on, on components to choose uh, that will go into our park and actually our, our street lights as well. Next slide, please. So here's a little um, Canva uh, picture of, uh, of what our um, little downtown uh, Civic Plaza is going to look like. We are an ag area, so we're gonna bring in grain bin gazebos, and we're actually reusing um, some old welcome to Akron signs for public uh, tables, um, for, for picnic tables. Next slide, please. So we also partnered with the Colorado Main Street um, architect, Larry Lucas, who um, did some technical drawings to help develop the project. Next slide, please. And then um, this is a typical snapshot of what your budget is going to look like when you do apply for dollar grants. This is an energy impact grant that we applied for. And just um, you know, being very deliberate about the, the technical details that you need to include in your budget. Next slide, please. And um, so there's a, a, a little uh, picture of Akron. So you can see how our community sizes and how impactful this project is going to be. It's right um, where it says Akron on the map. So we're really looking forward to executing this project and appreciate all the financial support that we've received. So we're actually paying for this project. We have leveraged um, both our general fund dollars as well as uh, multiple um, grants from different organizations within Colorado. So if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to get hold of me. You're welcome to email me if you um, have any questions about local municipal grants. Um, I, I feel like in our small towns, uh, it's our, our duty to our taxpayers to try and leverage some of those funds available to us. So um, hopefully that has helped uh, give, a, give an overview from a local level. Thank you. Amazing, Jillian. Thank you so much for providing your local perspective and being able to celebrate some of the cool projects you all have worked on. Um, so I think you all actually provided a great amount of information in your um, presentations. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, however, if I did miss them, please let me know. I do have a request if Karen Munson from City of Victor is still on the call. Munsert, I think is how you say your last name. I apologize. If you could put your email in the chat so we can get you connected with Alyssa, I think she um, had hopped off before you were able to ask your question um, regarding the ARPA reporting. Um, otherwise, uh, a quick reminder for everyone, we will be sending out the slides and recordings in our follow-up email. So if you were not registered for this call and you had this forwarded to you, please uh, make sure that you are registered. And then uh, we will also send out a running Q&A log that um, you all can submit questions to if something comes up following today's call. Um, so I will give it one last second to see if there's any last minute questions that come in. Um, otherwise, I think we're good to go ahead and turn it over to Dave to close out today's call. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to our participants for joining us today. Um, 
as Cheryl said, you will be receiving a follow-up email with all the links, all the, the presentations. Um, so keep an eye out for that. The next funding topic will be um, on June 12th, and it is on IIJA environmental funding. So hope you, hopefully you can join us then. Um, have a great rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you in the future.